Now we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to invite my colleague Jill Miller. Jill, who is the Director of Culture for the City of Glasgow, is going to have a conversation with Paloma Strelis, who is co-founder of Assemble Architectural Collective London. Do come up to the platform. And with Anel Moldak Metova. I'm so sorry, Anel, that I get that name wrong. Please correct me. Uh, and Anel is the creative producer and co-founder of the Citizen Space Bureau. Please join us on the platform. Um, we'll be the last session before lunch, so we'll be very um, sharp and try and keep this really exciting. Um, it's been a great morning, um, really, really interesting in terms of some of the things we've been hearing. Uh, and the last presentation was fantastic. That absolutely showed everything that we would, we would like to see, so that was, that was really, really good. Um, over the last um, day, yesterday and today, we've been talking about um, co-working spaces. Um, we were talking about, about yesterday about livable cities. Uh, and Claire talked in her presentation there about um, cultural infrastructure, physical infrastructure. And um, I have two guests here that in conversation are going to take that all a wee bit further in terms of how important um, cultural uh, buildings, physical infrastructure is in terms of our cultural planning. Now, Anel did some, I did a presentation last night in the speed dating, hopefully all of you saw that in terms of the work that she does. Um, so I'm just going to ask Paloma just in the first instance to tell you a bit about um, what she does and with the organisation that she works for. Hello. Um, so I am a co-founder of Assemble. We're in architecture, design and urbanism practice. It's based at a place called Sugarhouse Studios in London. Our mission is to realise buildings, enterprises and organisations that support creativity, collaboration and the active participation of people in cities. Our work spans civic spaces, cultural buildings, creative workspaces, community planning as well as organisational development. We see that the city can feel like a very disempowering place and so we're really interested in supporting uh, and connecting uh, the sort of uh, people and the world around them. Um, so, you know, whilst a society, I think that we often value culture in the form of grand public buildings, I think actually often we neglect the people, the communities, the processes and disciplines that are really essential in order to create that culture. Um, so we often work in contexts which have been undervalued, making them often the ones that are also the most vulnerable to transformation. And we really work to kind of celebrate and make visible these situations, imbuing them with uh, a sort of new value and uh, a new respect. Um, so our ambition is to contribute to a culture where more people feel enabled to participate and contribute to the world around them. Thank you for that. I think that's really helpful. And I think the slides and seeing the photographs uh, from all the presentations has really helped to communicate what it is that people are doing. So very, very helpful. Anel, I wonder, I've got a question for both of you to start with. Um, and I suppose it's a really simple question, quite general. Um, so what place does physical infrastructure have in cultural planning? Maybe ask Anel first to answer that. Um, yeah, thank you for um, inviting me to take part in this uh, discussion. Well, um, yesterday I was talking about one of the projects that I was involved in uh, called Arco del Mati, and uh, it is um, a rethinking of architectural, it is a, a project dedicated to rethinking and research of architectural identity of Almaty. And uh, actually, um, it's um, the interesting about this project is about is that uh, we used um, architecture as a trigger um, for discussion uh, to open a dialogue about um, what impact does um, architecture um, has has on people on uh, communities um, especially identity um, so and um, after after quite a while after we did some some research, um, uh, we created a pop-up museum of architecture uh, to stimulate the dialogue uh, with the communities. Uh, because for us, um, it was important and crucial not just to uh, research and have our own hypothesis of architectural identity, but also to involve a bigger community in discussion. And also, the, uh, the main thing about the, the pop-up museum of architecture was 
was not that we had some very valuable art artifacts or cool um, exhibits to show, but also, but it, the most important was to actually give people a word uh, and to be able to start this uh, this discussion. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your question, your question though, but the, yeah, yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just trying to stretch that uh, in this process, it's, it's important to rethink uh, the current state, uh, the current situation um, in, in the context of architecture um, and urban planning, uh, because uh, in, in our local context, in our city context, um, the city administration uh, decisions are moving faster than the communities um, and the pub bigger public has has time to 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 rethink their role and to be able to take part in the process. And of course, it takes time. And sometimes, like you know, the public administration uh, decisions happen faster. And then we have this physical matter that we have to face. So that's that's what we are trying to do as. Um, as a community right now, as a, as a project, uh, to, to kind of be able to influence this situation somehow. Yeah, thank you for that. Paloma, what, what do you think? Well, I was, I'm really interested to hear your answer, and I was also really interested to see you present your work yesterday, because it feels like actually there's a lot in common about how we talk about people in cities. Um, so evidently a well-curated <laughs> panel. Um, I think that, you know, from our perspective, equally, uh, you know, uh, sort of social and physical infrastructure are what creates architecture, are what creates the city. And so, you know, I suppose perhaps for a practice that has its background in architecture, um, we ha we actually believe that you don't you don't uh, the architecture of having a group of people sat around a table talking is kind of is is in a way the most fundamental, and that you can't start talking about buildings until you've first addressed the question of people and content so really the why and you know sort of reflecting on my own uh, professional uh, background I suppose a, a frustration uh, for us often has been how a buildings uh, the process of creating buildings happens because it feels like architects are are often invited at the point when all the other critical decisions have been made and you're sort of given a footprint and said there there you go make it as sort of as colorful or as shiny or as interactive as possible but actually we think it's fundamentally important that our architects are involved in an earlier stage of the process um, in helping kind of to find the brief and to get the, course, the right cohort and community of people together because actually the architecture is a community of people and the building comes second Yes, thank you for that. So a question for you and Elle, if you don't mind, and it's following on from what you've said. Uh, and the question really is around who has the voice? I mean, I think you started to answer that in your last um, answer. Who has the voice? Who owns the vision? And how can, and, uh, for, the, for the city plan, how, how, how does that happen? How do you make that work? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, if, if it's possible, I would like to, to, to set one of the slides that I have about Future City Manifesto. It's not there yet. Okay, whatever. But anyways, um, I just tell you a few words. Um, it's been a while since we, um, like, in the last three years, the situation in urban planning and uh, architecture in uh, and the level of public discussion in Almaty has changed dramatically due to the several uh, initiatives that are really active, uh, that really actively take part in, uh, you know, in trying to, to change the process. Um, some of the colleagues are here in the... In the audience, uh, besides our project, there is also Urban Forum as a platform. There is also um, a Well Multi Project and other other platforms that are uh, stimulating the public discussion. Um, but um, right now, our city is undergoing the um, the master planning. Uh, the The project, the master plan, uh, is developing a master plan, and I've been I take I took part in one of the. Uh, creative sessions in the beginning of the year, uh, together with one bureau uh, from UK. Uh, but I would like to comment on that process. So um, I'm, I'm really concerned um, as a professional and also as a, as a citizen of my city, uh, how can um, people take part in the process of master planning? And also being part of uh, Creative Producers International project um, run by Watershed, 
I uh, decided also to to um, to somehow see what can be changed in this um, in the process of um, crowdsourcing the future uh, the, the the vision of the future city because the the crucial question for me was like um, how can we change the the current situation of master of uh, city planning and design of master planning when um, you know we talk a lot recently about participation but it's not participative yet and so uh, one of the projects that I'm involved in right now is called Future City Manifesto and I, I, I run I ran uh, several uh, sessions together with different communities uh, of people asking them what city they want to live in what they appreciate most about the city and what would they like to change and for me as a professional it was a very important process itself because I understood a lot of things for myself in the process of like in, in the creative sessions so first thing was the people are not ready yet to be able to so it's it's hard to 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 drag uh, to to let people know like it, people are not allowing themselves to um to take part in the vision uh, of the future city they say well can i take part really it, it was like that Understanding that I that was a, one of the biggest insights when I started to run these sessions because, yeah, we can talk a lot about participation, but when you uh, talk to people and it's like, am I allowed to? So, and I just understood that we yet have to um, uh, develop new instruments for public discussion, um, set new priorities, and also, but it is very crucial that our public authorities do listen to uh, to the bigger community and um, do understand that they have to put participation as a really as a real process, not just a word. And I'm, I mean it. It's it's, um, it's just several sessions showed how far, like how long way we have to go to be able to design these instruments of participation, to invite people, to let them to let them think about that they have right to think about future city. The city that they will live in, the city that they want to raise their kids to, to have their future, to be creative and to all sorts of things. And not to, and not to want to leave. Because now we do have the situation when uh, we have uh, people uh, living, living country and living city in, in search of better conditions. And I, I have to say it because I have a lot of um, acquaintances that do look for better conditions. How can we hold these people in the city and how can, can we make them want to create for the city? How can they take part in it? That's the main question for me right now. Thank you. I mean, it strikes me that in, within that there's a lot, the complexity is that even if people were willing to listen, the community is not ready to necessarily take part. And so there's a lot of work with the, the community and the people that live in the city to, to actually engage them in the process. And I suppose that takes us as creatives or as creative people to think about how you do that and to do that in a creative way that so that people feel that they can uh, be included and they can uh, contribute and they will be listened to. So I think it is a, re a really, really important part um, of that. So Paloma, one, uh, one from you, for you, I think um, I'm very interested to know what you think good design is. Um, what does that look like and uh, who benefits? I think that's an interesting question. Um, and actually, I think the kind of the word look is quite interesting because actually I think that aesthetics are a very small part about what makes good design. Um, and I think that, you know, as, as with a person or a book, um, you know, you don't judge someone simply on their appearance, simply on the cover of the book, but actually we all know that what is fundamental is the underlying content and the message that contains. And I think exactly the same is true of architecture. And I actually think, and I think, I, can't, I totally understand why. Like it is so easy to judge a building on its facade whilst forgetting actually what its sort of fundamental purpose is. Um, and, and so I think we've sort of got a, a long way to go in terms of, uh, I suppose, maybe really uh, communicating uh, a, a language which is more accessible about about architecture and urbanism and design. And I think kind of touching probably on points that you just made and on some of the conversations of the last two days, I do think education is key to that. I think that actually we don't talk enough about design about and what sort of constitutes the material world around us. And, you know, 
Uh, my, ex I mean, my background is in design, but I'm well aware that I think people who don't have that kind of educational background really do often struggle um, with talking about the visual and material world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think what a number of our projects do is that they try to set up contexts that can enable people in the kind of a longer term to feel more confident with interceding in the world around them and so sort of one of those is a project say that we did in Glasgow which is called Baltic Street Adventure Playground and that is create, about creating an organisation that gives children quite literally the tools so wood and hammers and nails so they can begin to feel like they can have some agency in the world that they live in. And a second example would be uh, Black Horse Workshop, which is a uh, project in Walthamstow in London. And that is a very similar space, but it's more for adults. And that's a space where there's open access to woodworking and metalworking facilities. So once again, they have a kind of uh, community space where, uh, where you can access knowledge and uh, experience in, in, in making things. Thank you for that. And I suppose from that, the, the project that I know from in Glasgow, but also from what you're saying, what's really important to me, I think that what you're both saying is that it's how um, these physical spaces are the impact on the people that they're for, but it's actually how they impact on the place, whether that be the community, whether it be that, that be the city, whether that be the region. So I don't know, if you, do you have any examples of projects that you would like to...? Um, I, w I would just say that... Um, like I work mainly with the strategies and vision, mm -hmm. and I think that it's important to um, combine the two. Uh, working yeah. with physical, uh, by by introducing impact for physical space, like we discussed yesterday, a lot of co-working spaces that actually give people opportunity to be able to experiment and to, to see different scenarios of interacting with the city space and and design, but I think that it's crucial that there, is, there are some projects and initiatives that also stimulate dialogue and uh, do um, try to invent new vocabulary, because we yet have to design new vocabulary for the new reality that we live in. For example, now, like since three years, the, our public dialogue has changed dramatically. A community uh, is taking more and more a part in the discussion. But the instruments are not there yet. We, we, they are appearing, but they're not enough. And I just wanted to say that it's important to, um, uh, to reinvent the vocabulary, to introduce new terms and conditions and policies. So, because we are facing a new reality right now, the public is becoming more and more active in the discussion. Uh, communities want to take more part in, you know, in the city. They claim their right for the city more and more. Uh, the different, uh, very heated discussions uh, in Almaty showed that, uh, so that the people are eager to, to, to uh, take part in the dialogue. So we have to uh, respond to that. We have to uh, introduce new vision, to communicate this new vision, and to, um, to make sure that more and more people are included in the, in the process. Uh, and actually, the new vocabulary should be... Um, co-created so we have to kind of be able to, to spot what is happening right now in the to map all these um, new uh, things rising up from the discussion yeah, that's very helpful thank you Paul, do you want to add anything to that yeah I mean I suppose my my previous point was about it, how it doesn't matter what things look like but my second point is going to be <laughs> that it does matter what things look like is this still on? Yeah. Um, and, and I think, because I think that in a way it's great because it gives you a set of uh, tools to help tell a story differently. Um, so, for example, as I said, that we often work in situations where, uh, which might have been neglected, where people might have not taken very much care, where people failed to value what was there. And I think what architecture and design can do is to help uh, a context or a community tell their story in a way that will uh, demonstrate what is often there, but often not clear to other people. So for example, I mean, I think you can probably see from our work that I sort of do, I am interested in kind of craft and what things look like. And, and one building that I showed was a building that's covered with uh, multicolored handmade tiles. Now that is a, um, our old studio building, which is in a place called Stratford in London. And that is in a, uh, a context of, uh, 
industrial buildings. So it's a place in London um, which is, uh, you know, where the fabric of London have traditionally been produced, but which, you know, these working spaces are very much increasingly under threat as London expands. And, you know, I think that that building is a, is a building that we created to have affordable new studio space in London. And I think what that those tiles do is that they... Uh, they create a kind of context and a reason for people to look at something differently in a way that they hadn't looked at it before. So whereas in the past you might say, oh, who cares? Those are, you know, messy buildings. Um, and there's, there's perhaps no culture there. Actually, by kind of, by giving it a new face and by saying, actually, no, this is, this is valuable, this is important, this is where culture happens, you give you give people an opportunity to experience and see something differently. Thank you very much. What a fantastic place to stop. Thank you both speakers. Thank you very much.